in the section 1.1. Today we're going to be taking a look at functions and function notation. Um, and generally speaking, we're going to be using these skills really the rest of the year. So we have to make sure that we understand the notation, the meaning behind it, as well as uh, basically look at a, a few applied examples as far as how we're going to go about implementing that. Okay, so without further ado, let's dive in here. So first of all, what is a function? Well, basically a function is just based upon a mathematical relation a mathematical relation. Now, some of you may look at that and go, I don't even know what that is, right? What is a relation? And it's actually pretty simple. A mathematical relation in two sets basically just maps uh, elements of one set to the other. And that, I mean, more, more commonly, you guys would think about those as points, right? They have an x value, they have a y value, and therefore one of them is mapping to another. And, you know, a lot of times you guys think about those as input and output. But really, input and output only relate to functions, okay? Relations can be far more broad than that, okay? So we're kind of narrowing it down from here. So it's a mathematical relationship in which the independent variable can map to at most one dependent variable. Okay? Now, <clears throat> let's continue to break that down a little further, okay? The independent variable is really whatever we're picking to start off. And of course, if you guys are thinking about setting up a T table or, uh, you know, creating an input, you would of course know that as the X value. So generally speaking, we're going to use X to represent that one. And can map to at most one dependent variable. Well, the Y's are dependent upon that, right? Um, but we're not limited to Y's here. And really, as we move forward, we're going to use or F of X. Okay, so F of X is another way to talk about that dependent variable. And this is really our notation moving forward that we're gonna do our best to stick to, okay? All right, so let's look at one of the ways that we can actually represent this, okay? It says for the snowy tree cricket, there's a relationship between temperature and chirp rate, right? So we can estimate temperature by counting chirps in a 15 second interval, then adding 40, okay? So keep in mind, the chirps are in a 15 second interval, and then we will simply add 40 at the end to get the correct temperature. Um, let's also just assume that this temperature we're, we're discussing here is going to be in Fahrenheit, okay? And the reason for that, of course, is if we're going to be um, adding 40 in Celsius, we're going to get some really ridiculous temperatures that you would begin to hear the chirps, okay? So we can, we can kind of determine that just by thinking through the values at play, okay? So counting chirps in a 15 second interval, then adding 40, right? So it says the rule to find the temperature T from the chirp rate R in chirps per minute is an example of a function, right? So down below, they referred to R, the chirps per minute, as an example of our input, right? And they've talked about our output as T. And just for now, I'd really like us to just right off to the side, T of R. And that way we're thinking about the independent variable as R. That's the thing that uh, we're counting. And then temperature will be dependent upon that. That's what we're calculating as a direct result, OK? So it says the rule to find the temperature T from the chirp rates in chirp per minute is an example of a function. So for some number of chirps per minute, we can calculate temperature. Okay, that's it. That's the, the basic breakdown there, okay? So let's go ahead and come up with some values then, okay? What if we counted uh, no chirps in a 15 second interval? Well, if we go about adding 40, so that, that would of course be our input, right? And if we go about uh, just saying that's the number of chirps per minute then, right? I mean, if we extrapolate from the 15 per second, or uh, <laughs> sorry, the chirps per 15 seconds, and then we add our 40, we're gonna be left with a temperature of 40, right? 
So 0, 40 would be an example of our first sort of ordered pair here, the independent posted right alongside the dependent. Well, so what if we ended up coming with, let's say, 5, right? So by counting chirps in a 15-second interval, let's say we've got 5 of those, and then we add 40. Well, you may have noticed that we said R is actually chirps per minute, right? So what would that mean for our chirps per 15 seconds? Well, if we counted five there, but we're actually calculating ba this based upon chirps per minute, wouldn't that mean that we had, we had actually had 20 of those, right? So R at 20 chirps per minute is going to, we then divide that into four 15 second intervals, right? And we're gonna get five per 15 second interval. We can then add in our 40, and you guys, of course, will be left with 45, okay? Hmm. So 0, 40, 20, 45. Hmm. Let's continue on and let's continue thinking about R, what we're setting up here, as chirps per minute. And then we can sort of backwards engineer what we have up above. Okay. So chirps per minute, let's say we have, well, what's another number that's easily divisible by 4? That's really what we're going for, right? Um, let's go 40. Okay. So if we count 40 chirps per minute and then we count or we, we would then calculate the number of chirps in a 15 second interval. 40 divided by four is going to be 10, right? So we now have 10 to add to our 40 or 50, okay? Now, you may notice that we've got a bit of a pattern going, on, going here already. If you wanted to just sort of extrapolate based on this, you can feel free to. We'll go 0, 20, 40, let's go up to 60, right? Divide that by 4 to get our 15 second interval. So that would be 15 in a 15 second interval. And that would, of course, give us a temperature of 55, right? And finally, let's go ahead and go up to 80. So 80 chirps per minute <clears throat> would then be, of course, 20 in a 15 second interval. We add that in and we're getting our 60, okay? So here's a simple way to go about creating your table. But you do have to make really sure you're paying close attention to definitions, okay? This one being chirps per minute, we then had to backwards engineer how to get our chirps per 15 seconds, right? Okay. And then, of course, we were able to find temperature T. And once again, that was in Fahrenheit, okay? Values only really going to make sense in Fahrenheit, okay? Um, so in a formula, let's, let's process through this real fast. You may have noticed that there is a constant change in our output and there is a constant change in our input, the way that we ended up creating these values, right? Well, so what should be, you know, kind of ringing a bell in your head is the notion of a linear equation, or in this case, a linear function, right? So let's set this up using T of R. And that way, we're, we're trying to set up our function notation, okay, for some number of chirps per minute, R, we're going to get our output T, which is, of course, our temperature, okay? Well, if I'm going to set up a linear function like this, I know the go-to for most students is, of course, going to be slope-intercept form, right? Well, so let's see if we have our y-intercept anywhere. Our y-intercept would have 0 for the independent variable and then some value for the dependent variable. And that's really what we see here, right? So that 40 represents that b value, okay? You will automatically add 40 to whatever we would find per 15 seconds, right? Well, 20 in this case, as we move forward and try to figure out our slope here, you'll notice 20 comma 45, 40 comma 50. I mean, obviously you could use any two of these ordered pairs and simply find the slope, right? The change in y, say 40 to 45, is going to be an increase of 5. The change in our x value, our independent variable, is going to be 20. So that would be 5 out of 20, or 1 fourth of the number of chirps per minute, right? R our independent variable, okay? Now, hopefully what you guys are noticing here is this feels a lot like, obviously, y equals mx plus b, but also that y looks a lot different in this case because it's treated almost like an f of x, right? Using that function notation. So there's our input, just like you would expect up above, okay? And of course, f of x would then be our output, okay? I've kind of made this a simpler shorthand just for, for our own utility right now, okay? So finally, down below, let's go about uh, graphing this, okay? Now, because all these values are non-negative, 
I would go ahead and limit this down to the first quadrant. And if you need a quick recap, here are quadrants. In fact, this is something we're gonna, we're gonna come back to a lot second semester with trigonometry. There's a reason why we number them in this way. So it's quadrant one, two, three, and finally four, okay? So upper right, work your way around counterclockwise. That's your quadrants. So like I said, non-negative would indicate we can go ahead and set this up with our axes across the base and the left side, okay? Now normally you call this X and Y. Let's be a little more specific here. We're gonna refer to this as R and then we'll do T of R, right? Our input and our output. And then all we've really got to do is scale this in a way that's appropriate, okay? So based upon our, our independent variable, you'll notice we go up to 80. I think I'm gonna go ahead and count every two as 10. So that'd be 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, and 80. It gives us a decent amount to work off of, right? I think if you went smaller than that, it'd be really tough to mark everything you needed. Okay, and finally, let's look at our, our uh, independent variables, right? So we've got 40 through 60. We could, uh, we could do the same thing, but because these continue to just be five apart, I may actually wanna space them a little bit differently, okay? I may wanna go every two would be um, five instead of every two being 10. All right, so we'll do 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50. Well, obviously we're having a problem here, aren't we? We ran out of graph. So let's think if, if there's a solution to this, okay? What can you do to scale this down and look at a smaller region instead of just starting at zero? Well, some of you I know have dealt with this in the past with hope you've all seen it at some point, we can make what we call a break in the graph. It almost looks like a little Z there, okay? And then you can choose any value, so long as it's, it's above zero, since we're going up, you can choose any value to begin at, okay? So why don't we call that one, say, 30, and then we'll do this one, 35, 40, 45, 50, 55, 60, 65. And that way we've got exactly what we need here, okay? So those break in the graphs, Feel free to do those whenever, whenever necessary, all right? So 0, 40, we got our y-intercept here. We're gonna have 20, 45, so 20, 45. We're gonna have 40, 50. We're gonna have 60, 55. And finally, we're gonna have 80, 60. And there we have it. You guys have what appears to be a linear function right? That would, of course, continue on. But this is the part of the reason, actually, why I didn't bother going into quadrant two. If you think about it, these are based around chirps per minute. Is there any way to calculate a negative chirp, chirp per minute? Obviously, no, there isn't, okay? So this mathematical model really breaks down if you guys work anywhere left of zero, okay? Any, any of those independent variables being negative, you're going to have a problem with it, right? So it's important to remember kind of how your model is set up and whether or not it continues to be relevant past certain values, okay? Obviously, another way to think about that is you're not going to have 850 chirps per minute, right? That would be ridiculous. You're, you're never going to have a temperature that hot without all the crickets dying in the first place. So just think about the mathematical modeling and you're going to be just fine. All right, so Let's go ahead and take a look at the total cost of an item, okay? So it says including sales tax, and that's modeled by the formula C equals X plus 0.07X, right? So it says simplify this formula, then we're gonna use it in the following table to find some outputs, okay? Well, if we look at the right side there, I hope we all notice that these are like terms. They're both X to the first, right? And therefore we can add them just like if we had three X plus five X. So in this case, we're going to simply uh, rewrite this as C is equal to a 1.07X. And that becomes a simpler equation because you don't have to worry about multiple inputs, right? So let's just calculate some outputs here, okay? Uh, feel free to grab a calculator, follow along. Um, this is where, I'm guessing most of us have our TI-84s, and if not, keep in mind, you will need to get a graphing calculator for this class, so. All right, so $2 times our 1.07 should come out as $2.14. Feel free to just fill this in on your own, okay? 
All right, so next up, keep in mind we need to make these, re these values relevant. Um, here, for instance, I'm getting a 3.3705. So let's round that to the hundredths place, given that we're talking about uh, money. You know, that, that, of course, would be pennies. We don't have a smaller denomination than that. So uh, next up, 1732. Getting $18. And here we see a 0.5324. Quick reminder, look to the right of what you're rounding to. Is it between 0 and 4? If the answer is yes, you're going to leave this the same. You're going to round this stuff off. If it's between 5 and 9, you're going to bump it up a unit. Okay, so in this case, 18.53 is our rounded value. Okay, next up, $132.17 times our 1.07. 141.42. $141.42. And finally, 140.01 times our 1.07. And then we're getting $149.81, okay? So does this formula represent a function? Well, let's think about what that really means, okay? Going back to how we defined a function, we said that for any input, you can only ever get one output, okay? So those need to be distinct. Well, if I'm gonna just multiply by a number, a number times any number that I choose to plug in there will only ever give one result, right? And therefore, each value I plug in will only ever have one output. That's sort of the nature of linear functions with some sort of slope here, right? So does this formula represent a function? Yes. Absolutely it does, okay? So what is function notation? Well, I talked about this a little bit earlier but I wanna make sure that we've all kinda of locked this in because again, we're gonna be using it a tremendous amount here, okay? Now we know that X represents our inputs, otherwise known as the independent variable, okay? These all kinda of just mean the same thing, okay? We know that Y generally represents the outputs or the dependent variable, right? And so our function notation just takes this piece a little bit farther and refers to this as a function with input x. Now the reason why this is powerful is in a single expression you know both the input and an expression for the output, okay? So this of course represents the exact same stuff. These are your outputs or the dependent variable. Now common mistakes here, let's talk about them f of x looks a lot like f times x, doesn't it? And so this is one of those problems that you guys ran into back when you dealt with, say, trig. Okay, let's make a little break here. If you guys were plugging in sine of 30, I had a lot of students in the past that re would refer to this as sine times 30, right? Because they see parentheses and they immediately click to multiplication, okay? The same was true of say log base 7 of x and, and you know we would often hear well that's log base 7 times x and it's not multiplication okay let's just put that off to the side not multiplication okay in the same way that f parentheses x f of x is not multiplication okay so we need to start uh, recognizing all the moments that that does not represent multiplication okay and if you guys start to process through that, it'll start to get a lot easier for you. Like down below, this is not f times 2, right? This is a functional output with input or x value 2, okay? We'll get there in a second. So it says use function notation to describe the function with the formula c equals 1.07x. I'm perfectly fine with you guys calling this f of x equals 1.07x, or since the c is relevant, if you wanted to refer to that as c of x is equal to... 1.07x, that's fine too, okay? It just, uh, again, will we'll always show your input, okay, that independent variable inside those parentheses. All right, so it says below is the graph of function f, okay? So we're going to start to calculate some of these values. Um, it says evaluate f of 2, right? Evaluate f of 2. Well, let's think about this. f of 2, this is your input right? That would normally say f of x. So inside of the parentheses, I want you to think input, x value. Well, 
Let's just graph like x equals 1 real fast, okay? x equals 1 is going to make this a lot simpler for you guys to understand graphically, okay? So if we have x equals 1, um, I think a lot of students end up wondering, is that the vertical line at 1 or is that the horizontal line at 1? And they get it flipped, okay? Well, here's the easiest way to remember, okay? If we say x equals 1, you can give me literally any two points, and so long as the x value is locked in at 1, you will have the correct line, okay? So x equals 1, 1 comma 0, 1 comma 2. So if I were to graph those, 1 comma 0, 1 comma 2, you'll notice those are creating a vertical line, aren't they? Okay? So this would be our example of x equals 1. So let's just think about this for x equals 2. If x equals 2, that's going to be the vertical line, right one unit, isn't it? Okay? And therefore, I'm looking for the functional output. My independent variable was already locked in, so I want to find that dependent variable, right? And we see that cross at 2, 0. 2, comma, 0, then 0 is going to be our output, all right? Let's do the same thing with f of negative 2. Once again, the x value, if it helps you, feel free to do this for the first few. The x value is negative 2. That is a vertical line here. And this one's a little weird. You may notice there is a little hole in the graph, and a couple units up, we had a defined value. So this is actually where we're crossing. That independent variable is negative 2. The dependent variable is 3, and therefore our output is 3. Okay. Next up, evaluate f of 3. So our x value is 3. You can imagine that uh, vertical line. And our uh, dependent variable appears to be a couple, like maybe just a little bit above 2. Let's just call it like 2.1 or 2.2 or something, okay? Just based on what we're seeing there. It was close, but not quite there. Okay, well these last couple kind of mix it up, change it up for us, okay? You'll notice it says f of what is equal to 0, right? And that's because we don't know the x value. But f of x, otherwise known as the y value, y equals 0, doesn't it? Okay, so if I know the y value is 0, let's think about that as a line, just like we thought of the x values as a line. Once again, we'll do the same thing. Any two points, and so long as the y value is 0, we have the correct linear equation, right? So maybe we'll do 1, 0, we'll do 3, 0, write 1, write 3, and of course this is our line, right? Huh f of what is 0? Well, because this is a horizontal line, it does not have to have only one input. Remember what we said? Inputs have only one output. Output? No, they can have lots of different inputs, right? You'll notice it hits here, it hits here, and it hits there. So what are those inputs? What are the x values? Well, that's negative 3, 0. This is 0, 0. And this one is 2, 0, right? So our inputs, we can literally just say x is equal to, that's what we were finding after all, negative 3 and 0 and 2. Make sure your list is comprehensive. Otherwise, you're not giving me a, a fully accurate solution. Let's try it again. f of what, so we're looking for the x value, right? And the y value, f of x, equals 3, okay? So if y equals 3, that's again a horizontal line except this time it will be up three units. So let's see where all we're going to cross there. Well, we know we crossed here earlier, right? When we had negative two, it kind of had that hole in the graph. It jumped up to three. So this point is negative two, three. And if we follow that across, you'll notice we hit here as well, at four, three. So for what x values is this true? When x is negative two and when x is four, okay? Well, there we have it. All right. So you guys have the first couple down, and let's wrap it up with using a test now, okay? Like I said on that last set, on these last problems, it, it may have been a little confusing for us that the x value would lock in a particular y value, but that wasn't the case in reverse. A particular y value could have multiple x values, right? Well, <clears throat> there was this rule I know you guys talked about back in Algebra 1 and Algebra 2, and it's known as the vertical line test, okay? 
All you've got to do, I mean, if you want to run a pencil across the graph, if you want to just like do it with your finger, or you just want to visualize it, that's fine. But all you really have to do is imagine a vertical line running from left to right on your graph. Okay, so you're going to just move that across your function, your potential function, your relation, and determine if it's a function. Okay, and our rule is pretty simple. This can't touch the, the graph more than one time. It can touch no times, that's perfectly fine. But if you ever have more than one output for this x value, after all, a vertical line is an x equals a constant, then you're going to, to not create a function, right? So let's move that to the side and let's just kind of see what we're dealing with, okay? I'm only ever hitting once here. Okay, so this first graph, since I only ever hit one point, is a function. Which graph below represents a function? We would definitely say graph one does. Let's try that on graph two. Well, here I'm hitting nothing, so that's totally fine. Right there, right at the edge, I would hit one point, right? But then the moment I cross past that, you'll notice we now have multiple outputs for a single x value, for a single input. So maybe this is like four units left, that's up one, that's down one. Negative four, one, negative four, negative one, that's the issue, right? So we would say graph two is not a function. For the same reason, you're gonna have problems here on graph three. If you pick anywhere inside of that circle, you're gonna be hitting twice, so it's not a, not a function. And finally, graph four, okay? In fact, if you chose right here, because that's a segment of values, there are actually an infinite number of outputs, aren't there? Because there are infinite points on a segment, okay? So definitely not graph four. All right. So now that we, we have a bit of a visual test that we can use, <clears throat> let's try this using some, some uh, data, using some values here. <clears throat> it says, uh, a waiter is paid an hourly wage plus any tips that he or she receives. The table below lists the number of hours that a waiter has worked over the last week along with the earnings for the night. Okay, so days one through seven. Uh, worked six hours, four hours, four hours, five hours, eight hours, eight hours, and then none, right? And then our pay, we're getting 75 total, 45 total, etc. And of course, if you don't work, you're not getting any pay. All right. So is the number of hours worked a function of the day of the week? So let's break this down. Is hours a function of day? Okay, hours of day. That's kind of what I want you guys to start processing through. So this you can think about as H of D. Pay close attention to the wording and then it's gonna be pretty simple, okay? Is hours a function of the day? So day would be the independent variable, okay? So those are my like inputs, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Let's look at hours and see if we ever get more than one output. One only has one output. Two only has one output. Three only has one output. So on and so forth. Think about that. Could you possibly work six hours and three hours on a single day? No, because even if you took a break, that's just nine hours total, right? This is the sum of hours worked, okay? So therefore, we're gonna say yes. Yes, this is a function, okay? Next up, is pay a function of the day? So pay of day. After all, we really only have these three options, days, hours, pay, right? So pay of day, that's what we're looking for. So day is our independent variable, right? And if I plug those in as my x values, I'm getting 75, I'm getting 45, I'm getting 40, 70. I never get multiple pays on a single day, do I? And therefore, each independent variable, after all, these are all unique. That's what makes them, makes them simple. I don't get one, day one, day two, day three, day three, right? They're talking about individual days. So as we see them all map to only one pay, we're gonna say yes, that's a function. Well, finally, is pay a function of hours? Well, so pay of hours, okay? I guess you could use this of, it doesn't really matter, okay? So pay of hours, there's our independent variable, okay? hours. These are my x's, right? Well, if you look down that list, you'll notice we have repeats here and we have repeats here. That could be problematic, right? Because as I move to my pay as my output, well, this input only has one output. The input of 4 has an output of 45, but 4 also has an output of 40. 
Think about graphing that, 445 and 440, wouldn't that be one point directly over the other? And therefore, you wouldn't pass your vertical line test, would you? Okay, so right there, that's creating a problem. 8100, 8140 is also creating a problem. So we're gonna say no, this is not a function, okay? For some number of hours, you can earn different types of pay. Well, let's just think about the variability. Why would that be? According to what we were told up above, a waiter is paid an hourly wage plus any tips he or she receives. Why could you earn more than one amount of money? Because tips are variable, aren't they? Obviously, the hourly wage wouldn't be, but tips certainly would be. All right. Hopefully, that sums things up for you. If you guys have any questions, as always, please feel free to uh, message or email, and you can now continue to your homework. Good luck, guys.